the Gospel of John. It's also our last day in the Gospels. And I have some things I'd like to share with you before we get into our final things here on John's Gospel and the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the Gospels themselves. And I've shared some things with you <clears throat> as far as knowledge of Scripture goes and understanding the text as literature. And helpful information for defending Scripture and defending the faith. Because we will be challenged in why we believe. We'll be challenged in our understanding of Scripture by others and even by our own reading and journey with God and the process that we're on. Christianity requires, I have heard it put, Christianity requires a happy trust in Scripture. And I think that is put brilliantly. A happy trust in Scripture. And when we're diving in, and we're exploring the text, and we're really digging in our tradition, we can lose that happiness sometimes. We can even get bored. That happens when we're immersing ourselves. And certainly there are times of exhilaration and the Spirit of God turns lights on and, and uh, pours fresh grace and mercy on us and power when we're in the Scriptures. Then there are even times when we can be a little troubled and upset in our faith when we're exploring issues of the text. And I first want to say we shouldn't be afraid to explore issues of the text that are the foundation of our tradition of happily trusting in the scriptures. A happy trust in the scripture is the product of having a strong faith in the reliability of the text and in the authority of the scripture in the life of the church and in the life of the believer and then uh, certainly the truthfulness of the text right so if we, we trust what we believe to be true when your parents told you you shouldn't have snicker bars for breakfast they were telling you the truth and hopefully you believe them that was good information <laughs> and i hope you don't do that and so when we read the scriptures, and we uh, a happy trust in scripture means we believe what it says, and we uh, base our life and faith and our outlook and our world view on, on the scriptures. Yet there are times when we come across things that trouble our happy trust in the scripture, and they upset that, that, uh, that content place of simply believing the text. Has, anybody have, has anyone had that happen before? Okay? Yeah, me. Uh, I've had it happen to me. And specifically with the Gospels, what we would say the very center of the Scriptures, the Jesus stories. And then we have Paul interpreting that and others interpreting that, mainly Paul, what that means for Christianity and the Church. But we have the Jesus stories, and we can come across things that we start to wonder, is there an error here? Wait a minute. Is there a chronological error here? One writer says this, and the other writer says that when Jesus taught on this, this happened. And that's different than what this one said. Does anyone have any examples of that, where that's happened to you, when you're in the scriptures? This is the kind of thing, when you go, if you go to another college after this, uh, after Elam, you'll hear about these things, and people will just throw this stuff at you. Professors will throw it at you and say, this is why you shouldn't believe the text. Yeah. I uh, was talking to somebody on Facebook once, and they were saying, uh, they brought scripture to me, and they were like, uh, you know, this scripture says, this person saw the face of God, and then this, this scripture says, no one can see the face of God. And I was completely stumped because I had no idea like, mm -hmm. what to do with that. But now looking, you know, I probably didn't look at the context of what was being said and all mm -hmm. that stuff, so... I should yeah. add a deeper understanding of it, and that's why that's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just looks like a that that looks like an obvious contradiction yeah. that someone could say, "Aha, gotcha!" On there, it's not the inerrant word of God. And that's the common response there. Yeah, I think the one you hear the most, well, the one I've heard the most is the um, one where they make claims about the uh, the um, crow, uh, the, the rooster crowing. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's depending on which one, um, which gospel you read, it says it, it says a different numbers, although it's usually implied that they're just saying it, and then when Mark says it, he's like, he count, he, he actually counted the number of times, because mm -hmm. Peter was there, while the others are like, hey, crowds! Mm -hmm. Don't you wish. Mm -hmm. you know exact numbers, because well, we're not from Western civilization, where that's usually important. Right, right. Yes, Caitlin. The thing that I actually, I've actually started to enjoy when I find a contradiction. Um, it actually makes me really excited and not scared anymore because mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I've just been just that that scripture in Proverbs that says it's the glory of God mm -hmm. to conceal a thing, but the honor mm -hmm. of kings to search out a matter. Mm -hmm. I put it in the front of my Bible, and I was like, you need to remember that with this with the word, because now when I see. A, a seeming contradiction. Like, yes, let me just dig this out because once I dig it out, it it's even better. Mm -hmm. like, it just proves the word just proves itself. Mm -hmm. And you go through the Geisler every time you go through a section, he has that whole like pages. Of, yeah. Like, how to deal with this? Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, it's good. good right yeah, thank you. One thing that uh, I mean, it's it's pretty obvious when you read it, but one thing that used to always get brought up to me was uh. An eye for an eye, but then Jesus says, you know, love your neighbor, you know, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek and whatnot. And, you know, of course, if you read it all in context, it describes, you know, what the eye for eye actually meant with the whole servant or your wife. And, like, mm -hmm. it get, uh, you gotta get real deep into it, but that was something that somebody, uh, because of where I was when I got saved when I was incarcerated, that was something they'd always they'd always talk to you. It wasn't necessarily always an argument, but that was one of the things they always came to you was, mm -hmm. well, how come it's an eye for an eye here, but then over here you're supposed to turn your other cheek. So, mm -hmm. I mean, right, contradictions or yeah, and people that are looking to challenge the faith will very quickly be able to find those things, especially now that so much is available to us with a few clicks, and. In previous generations, Christianity held a place in culture in our society, was a pillar of the culture, and was a significant member of society, the church. That is no longer the case. Christianity for many uh, is um, uh, to protect, you could even say, to protect ourselves from so much pluralism in the world, it's easy for us to become a subculture where we live in our own world and we have our own celebrities and our all we do all of our own things and all of our own activities and we're not infiltrating the rest of the world. And uh, to, as a way of keeping ourselves from having to so constantly be uh, in a world that doesn't believe anymore because our culture doesn't believe like it used to, even just a couple generations ago, really even one. Um, but now when you share your faith with someone, moments later, and if they're rude, they can even do it while you're talking. <laughs> they can type things up on their phone and find pages that uh, seek to debunk the very things you're saying. Right? And to undo and to challenge and just point out why Christianity should not be believed. Even specific, They can type in the verse and say, uh, you know, they can type in a study of the verse you're sharing with them and see all of these varying views about it. So whoa, what do we do in a world like that? And specifically with the issue of the Gospels, which are the foundation of uh, the Christian faith in the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection and his miracles and things, we will find at times, <clears throat> and this may be more so the case with you, you'll find where you, it seems that one writer tells something different than another when Jesus taught on, let's say, Jesus was teaching on money, and he teaches this, he gives this teaching, and it says he was in this place. And then in another gospel, you find a very similar teaching from Jesus. It's a little different, which is strange. But then it says he's in an entirely different place. And so the first response, the emotional response is, oh no. The writers really did make mistakes. That's the kind of fears we get. And that's what people say. There, see, there you go. Now, there are some scholars that will say, I believe in the story of Jesus. I believe uh, in his teaching. I believe in Paul's interpretation. But I also believe that they were just people who were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they made mistakes. And what that is, is that's a more liberal position on the scriptures. I don't hold to that. I hold a more conservative, I hold a conservative position that they did not make, the, these are not chronological mistakes. 
that they were allowed to add their interpretations and teachings, as, which they do uh, as they're crafting it. And specifically with the issues of stories and the sequence of events that can really throw you off. This is helpful here. The Gospels are not diaries. Right? right? What's a diary? A diary is a daily record, or if it's not daily, it follows a sequence of days and events in a person's life or in, a, in something that they're doing. They're keeping a diary, right? And diaries can be more than just, um, I'm mad at Susie because I found out that she likes Bob too. They can be more than that. Diaries can be about very significant things. They can, people can make a diary on uh, you know, the development of a new uh, skyscraper. And this is very significant for the contribution to research and study of uh, city development and things. Okay? But a diary follows chronologically ordered events. And if we, if we were thinking, and that's how we normally think that this is how people would tell a story, and narratives must always be chronological because they're telling a, a story, the Gospels are not diaries. And that's okay. The Gospels are an anthology. They are anthologies. That is a collection, carefully crafted collection of Jesus stories put together with a purpose in mind to present the life of Jesus and the interpretation of what he said and did and to teach people the evangelistic, the gospel message of salvation and the resurrection and the Christian life. And so anthologies are a collection. Um, uh, they are a carefully crafted anthologies of Jesus' stories not diaries. They are meant for us to be able to read and enjoy them and to get into the stories and to be able to receive from them their themes and emphases and the meanings behind them. And that, uh, that's, that, that's not, this is not some kind of radical new way of uh, telling a story and presenting events of history. They were purposely, they will take stories of Jesus, let's say uh, Luke had in mind, um, to uh, Luke had in mind that he was going to, he wanted to present Jesus' teaching on money. <coughs> and so Luke, just for an example, took this teaching from Jesus on money that was done over on this side of town. And then he also knew he had in his packet of uh, documents and records and from his interviews with other eyewitnesses, he knew that there's also this teaching that Jesus gave, but it was over here in the temple. Luke has in mind, I want to present passages from Jesus on his teachings on money, and so which there are a lot of them on money. And so he'll take the one from the temple and the one from over on the corner of town in the street, and he'll put them together. And if we were to say, let's read all of these sections of Jesus, and if we're to start thinking, oh, we just assume that this was all given at one time. That's where we can start to get confused because then we see them happening in separate locations somewhere else. Does that make sense? Why it doesn't need to be chronological? They're putting them together. Um, and then the other, the other instance that the other thing that can happen uh, with with historical events is you can find the teachings themselves seem to be so can be seemingly so different in one gospel than they are in the other. One of them seems so much longer or so much more in depth. And then over here in Mark's gospel, let's say it's so uh, just truncated and shrunk down. What's going on there? And there could be two things that often happen in the gospels. One of them is that the writer only included the parts that they felt were necessary for what they were presenting. And we believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The other writer wanted to include as much detail as possible and was not concerned about shortening things to get to the point. Or, Jesus could have taught it multiple times. And that is to be expected. Jesus would go from place to place. 
move very quickly often, and it's very likely that he had certain teachings that he wanted to uh, introduce to the people, and the new things that God was doing with the bringing in of the kingdom and the new covenant, certain things he would want to touch on, because he knows that in this town, they struggle with money, and they have make it an idol just like they do over here in this town, and so he'll teach that there, and he may have expounded more on it in one, uh, in one place. So these are just real simple, uh, logical, uh, helpful things that we can think of that can get us out of this swirling moment where we say, oh no, you know, as, as, uh, as scholars, we get these scholarly moments and say, oh, I didn't know this was here, that person that was saying Christianity, I shouldn't believe, and they showed me that, I didn't know that that was there. This can help us there to look at the text as literature and to understand what kind of literature it is. All right, anybody have any comments or questions on that? As our last, uh, last uh, look into the Gospels as far as literature, at least in this course. No? Okay. Why don't you turn in your Bibles to John 15, 26 through 27. And I want to introduce to you with this verse... John's Gospel and the Holy Spirit. This is a big theme in his Gospel. We can be very thankful that he included stories that are not in the other Gospels, and he emphasizes Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit and even the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I would like at the end of class today to show you a little clip from a movie called The Gospel of John that I think portrays, uh, they do some things kind of their own artistically, but uh, that portrays the ministry of the Holy Spirit through Jesus as it is in the text very faithfully. And I want you to catch that. Okay, John 15, 26 through 27. I'm going to read this in the NIV, and it's a little different, and this is good than it is even there on the screen with the word, with the third word there, at least in the English language, the third word with what's used there. Let me read this to you, and you can follow along in your Bible. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus gives us here three insights about the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop on that first word right there. Notice that as I read that and compared with the one on the screen and compared with some of your texts, there's a different word there for this name, naming the Spirit. My NIV says Counselor. And it's good that they have, it has a capital C because it's referring to God, yes. God the Spirit. Mine says Counselor. This one says Advocate. What does yours say? Helper. 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 Comforter. Comforter. Okay. Oh, boy. That's a lot. Which one is it? It's all of them. This is one of those words that has a very rich and full meaning in the Greek in one word that we in the English are not able to convey with one word. And I like to think of that how Jesus came at the right time and God's redemptive plan of history followed his timeline, even sometimes with the languages that were spoken in the day, truth, the way truth could be conveyed in a way that is better than it can be conveyed in English. So yeah. right away we think, well then, you know, this is a problem. Uh, we're not getting the full measure of God's word here in the English. And I say, and others say, that we get what we need. And what is in our scriptures that has been done faithfully by renowned biblical scholars, we have what is sufficient for life and faith in the scriptures. And that's why it's good to have multiple voices on the text. And this is an example. Jesus is saying that he's coming and he's going to be the counselor. What's a counselor do? Counsel. Counsels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, counsels, gives advice. Uh, uh, helps you to learn where you have issues, right? One of the things that counselors are, um, that God uses counselors, and I believe he uses even non-believing counselors, although you have to be very careful, is he help, they help people.
stumble and, uh, and have problems. And certainly the Spirit of God is the ultimate counselor. What, what about an advocate? What's an advocate do? <laughs> Advocates, right, yeah, this is real, uh, this is real <laughs> challenging here. <laughs> He's a comforter also. He comforts us. And so Jesus is saying that someone wonderful is coming that does all of these things. And as they heard the, the, these words from Jesus, who this was that coming. And we get a little window in here into the purpose of the Spirit's coming in these two verses. What is, besides the, the meaning of that word, what is the purpose of the Spirit's coming? Testify about Jesus. Testify about Jesus. Yeah. Ministry of the Holy Spirit to testify about Jesus. Jesus knew. The disciples didn't know, or at least they weren't really getting what Jesus was saying, that a time was coming soon when he was going to depart away from them in the flesh, and he wasn't going to be with them anymore in that way. He knew that this was not going to be easy for them. This was going to be traumatic, and so Jesus was preparing their hearts that I will be with you, and I will continue working through you, and you will continue coming to know me. And I would think at that time that when they heard these kinds of things, they just must have been like, what? what? And you get this sometimes from them. What, what is he talking about? I don't get this. Don't get it. And Jesus was preparing them uh, and giving them even the purpose of the coming of the Spirit to testify about him. And then in verse 27, he is, he is giving them here a mission. When this happens to you, disciples, even if you don't fully understand this now, this is just kind of the background of the, his experience with the disciples that I'm putting here. You must also testify about me. And so he's revealing to his disciples he has something more in mind, and it's going to come by the Spirit. Look at John, uh, turn back to earlier in your Gospel to John 3, 1. And we're just going to survey some passages on the Spirit here, just a few of John's key passages on the Holy Spirit. John 3, 1 through 8. The story of Nicodemus. And I will uh, just summarize here. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He is afraid uh, because of how uh, politically problematic that would have been for him to be seen with Jesus during the day. Uh, he He's catching up with Jesus at night, and he's asking them, he's really wanting to hear from Jesus, from himself, and discuss with him, because Nicodemus is seeing that there's something here more than what his colleagues are saying. And so, uh, G Nicodemus says to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus introduces, right here, so much of the purpose of his coming and the role of the Holy Spirit in making this happen. It says, verse 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And these are the famous words from Nicodemus uh, summarized. What, what do you mean? Surely nobody can go back into their mother's womb and be born from their mother again. And that helps us to know that Jesus was really giving that concept of being birthed again, having a, a new birth of life. Because Nicodemus said, whoa, uh, this sounds a little strange to me. And look at verse 5. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus is describing to Nicodemus the way of the Holy Spirit in giving new life and new birth to people. This is a central passage in the New Testament for, uh, for becoming a believer. And I want to, I as we survey these here for a few minutes, 
I want, if you have a Greek Bible or you have any little tools there that you can click real easy, you might want to look at this with me here. When Jesus uses the word spirit in this case, whenever you see the word here, spirit, in, uh, your, in your English, he's using one of two words, pneuma and pneumatos. Pneumatos. Okay, you don't have to try to copy that down there. Just look at this. You're not going to be tested. You're welcome to if you want to. When you see this word pneuma or pneumatos, what does that look like to you in the English? Does anybody see anything similar? Pneumonia. Pneumonia. Yeah. Uh, not that, certainly uh, the results of the of God's pneuma and pneumonia are very different. <laughs> but why would why would pneumonia? Why do we use that word pneumonia? What's the problem going on with a person that has pneumonia? How many of you have ever had pneumonia before? Breath. Breath. Yeah. I have a scar in my left lung from when I had pneumonia and. Don't have the time to tell the story of what happened when I got a big giant needle. It was a bad situation <laughs> when I got a shot for it. But it's because it has to do with breath. And Jesus is using a word with Nicodemus here. He is speaking of the breath of God. Blown. And then he makes it very clear. He explains it and illustrates it with the natural wind around us. You can't see it. You don't know where it's going, uh, coming from or where it's going, but you can see the effects of it. And Jesus is saying the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the blowing of the breath of God in the world. And as obvious as it seems, we need to always be aware of this, of who the Spirit of God is in the world. He has come that people could be born again, but we will not see with our eyes the Spirit of God. He's blowing. God's breath in the world is moving. And when people believe, He blows upon them and they are born again with new life. And we will spend our Christian life not visibly seeing God. And often forgetting the presence of God. Have you ever forgotten the presence of God for far too long as a believer? Yeah, me too. And we have Jesus' teaching here that God is blowing His breath and He is bringing new life on people. And in the context of what is happening here, what Jesus was saying, if we're just to put this in theological, in a theological statement, uh, you could put it this way. And I want to say that whenever you do this, what the text says is better than what a theological statement says. But it helps us to think about it. Jesus was saying that this being born again is born from above by way of the wind of God's Holy Spirit breathing life into the spirit of a person who has believed. This is a theological statement there that I just, as I looked at study resources and uh, brought them together in the meaning there, what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus when he was saying, what are you, Jesus, what are you talking about? This doesn't make sense to me. You are born from above by way of the wind of God's Holy Spirit, breathing life into the spirit of a person who has believed. And you might want to jot this down. This is the same definition. This is the same word that is used in John 7, 37 to 39, when it speaks of the Holy Spirit. This is John's, uh, John's input here on Jesus and the Spirit in his gospel. Anybody have any uh, thoughts or comments about that before we move to the last passage for today? Yeah. What is that? What is that again? Uh, the other one? Yeah. <clears throat> John 7, 37 to 39. And there are others. I'm just highlighting uh, some here, real familiar ones. 7, 37 to 39 is... 14. When Jesus, refer, uh, when Jesus is talking about the, uh, the life, receiving life from the Spirit on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And this, he's speaking of life flowing in a person. And then John describes it. John explains it to us. John gives us a, his own theological moment here. In verse 39, by this he meant the Spirit. 
whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And that helps us here. This is John's. We need John's input. We need all of the Gospels. I, I believe fully and, and affirm the tradition of our faith that has affirmed the four Gospels as the, as the rule of our faith and the rule of the Jesus story. And John gives us this, you, this major emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Why don't we turn here to our last one for the morning, John 20. And this is a post-resurrection account. Yay. After Jesus has risen. And we're going to look at verses 19 to 31. Who would like to read us uh, read this for us? 19 through 31. Okay, Kylan, thank you. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he said so, or when he had so, so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me. Even so send I you. And when he said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Rejoice ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins and remit, they that remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, um, well, that's that's good. How about you stop there? Because um, let's just focus with our time. Thank you, Kyle, on this specific part here on the Holy Spirit. I was going to have us look at what happened with Thomas there and how Thomas came to the faith and how that is often the case with people who won't believe until they see things. Uh, but I don't think we'll have time for that. Thank you. So Jesus here appears to the disciples, the door's locked. Why did they lock the door? They're scared. Yeah. They're scared. They're, scared. Mm -hmm. They're in trouble. Their leader's gone. He died. Uh, they're probably too traumatized by the whole thing to be thinking about all the preparatory statements and teachings that he gave them at this moment uh, that they're in. And so Jesus appears. He twice blesses them with peace. And he commissions them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He commissions them here, which is, follows up on the things he had already been saying to them about what the, uh, the purpose of the Spirit would be. And then in verse 22, it says that he breathed on them. And that means physically. He, fit, he was there in the flesh. Physical, and that's very obvious from the story, because of Thomas. Specifically because of Thomas, we know he was there in the flesh. Uh, who doubted, he breathed on them physically and said to them, he gave them a command in the second part of verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit. The language that is used here, the, la the uh, Greek language, is he was saying to them, receive right now the Holy Spirit. But this is before Pentecost. Yeah. This is before the day of Pentecost. When the Spirit was poured out. Yes, Caitlin. So is this when they were born again, but not filled with the Holy Spirit? That's what I believe, and that's what other scholars believe. Like my, uh, my uh, for instance, my commentary notes here, which is very conservative uh, commentary on the Gospels, just says that he was giving them a partial deposit of the Spirit before the day of Pentecost. Okay. But they're acknowledging what the, what the wording here says, receive right now. Of the Holy Spirit. And there'd be some that would say that this was only symbolic, that Jesus did not really, there was no activity of the Holy Spirit upon them at this moment. He was just speaking to them, symbolizing what was about to happen uh, on the day of Pentecost. And I would say, then why did he walk up to them and physically breathe on them? Don't you think if Jesus appeared in the flesh after the resurrection in the room with you and he breathed on you, something is going to happen? Something is going to happen. And it's in the context of the forgiveness of sins. Even in the context of what he says when he tells them, he commands them to receive the Holy Spirit right now, and it's in the context of the issue of the forgiveness of sins. And so there's new life that is entering into the disciples in this moment, 
And it is preparing them for a new way of relating to, to Jesus. It's preparing them for the day of Pentecost to be <laughs> sent out and on mission for Jesus. Uh, and so we see here what John gives us in this very important account here of the ministry of the resurrected Christ in the life of his followers. His ministry to us is the same, but he's not in the flesh. The breath of God being blown on us. And let's look here very quickly at a couple of these words that are here. That when we really acknowledge the text for what it is, and nobody is going to have to read this out loud. So. <laughs> right here. This is the word when it says, and he breathed on them. All right, and again, you don't have to write all this down, but you might want to make a note of this important word in verse 22. The word is enephysisin. Uh, it might be pronounced a little different than that, but the emphasis is on the I sound there. Enephysisin, and in the context, what happened here with this word, especially with the next word, uh, lavete, which is right over here. You see this one here? When Jesus said, receive, he was saying them, take, he breathed on them, and then he immediately said, take and receive of the Holy Spirit. In the context of what happened in this moment, is they were breathing in Christ's in breathing. And this, this is a, uh, a context-based, word uh, meaning-based, statement on what happened in this moment. They were breathing in Christ's in breathing of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we're able to say that this is not something that was just symbolic. This was not just a symbol for the future. That there was an active ministry of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples at this moment, preparing them, cleansing them, and giving them a new relationship to the Lord so that they're prepared for ministry. And certainly on the day of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they were uh, activated into supernatural power ministry and power gifts. Okay, so we get that moment there, and I have for you, as we, as we finish up here, a video that I think portrays this beautifully and faithfully. <laughs> 